Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Talent Playbook Podcast. My name is Jason Ferrara. I'm the Chief Marketing and Strategy Officer at Outmatch and your host for this podcast. Our podcast focuses on strategies for transforming your world of work. During each podcast, we highlight someone who's transformed their organization or industry in a significant way. Today's guest is Tony Bridwell, the Chief People Officer of Ryan LLC. Let me start by saying I could have talked with Tony all day long. <laughs> he's, he's easy to talk to. He's full of great stories. He's got great insight. And he just asks really insightful questions. Most of this podcast focuses on developing employees and developing a culture that can transform an organization. Tony has a ton of experience here. And he thinks about the employee life cycle and how to proactively manage that life cycle all the time. He addresses in the podcast what what their biggest people challenge is at Ryan. He talks about the formula for learning that they apply at Ryan with their employees and how to improve what he calls the sticky rate of training with employees. We also get some insight into Tony's really diverse educational background and how that diversity has helped build his career how through that diversity in his education, he discovered his purpose and what his advice is for others who have yet to discover their purpose and how they can go do that the same. So without further delay, here's the Talent Playbook podcast with Tony Bridwell, the Chief People Officer at Ryan LLC. So Tony, thanks for joining me today on the podcast. Great to have you here in the office. Thanks for coming in. It, this is great. I love to be here. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to do is, you know, we talked about the fact that you work for a company called Ryan. I'd like to understand a little bit about what that company does, who they are. And uh, I just think our listeners would benefit from knowing that too. A hundred percent. Ryan LLC. And it's like one name, Ryan, right? You always want something else to go with it. So it's Ryan LLC. We are the world's largest tax consulting company based in headquartered in Dallas, Texas. We actually have offices in seven countries, uh, 22, 2300 people uh, throughout the world. And we're often referred to as the neurosurgeons of tax. Mm -hmm. So we're not, don't think of H&R Block or, uh, you know, somebody like that. We're the ones that come in and look at the specialized tax that happens inside organizations and provide consulting and recovery services for organizations that have paid too much. So for instance, in 2017, we recovered over two and a half billion dollars in overpaid taxes for our clients. Wow. Yeah. And and often these are things that, uh, you know, sometimes the clients aren't even fully aware that they're overpaying on this because tax codes can be pretty complex. And yeah. so our tax consultants actually are some of the few people in the world that actually get in and geek out on reading tax yeah. codes. Yeah. And we're able to interpret tax codes at a level uh, that allows our clients to realize their full, their full savings. So Brent Ryan, who founded the firm 27 years ago, he has a very, clear saying i've heard him say it multiple times since i've been there we believe every organization should pay um, their fair share of taxes but not one dollar more and so uh, we have taken some of our uh, findings all the way to the supreme court to defend um, and the model that we're set up on is is so unique in the business it's one of the reasons why we've grown so much it's we're on a performance-based model and we've actually defended our business model um, at the highest, at the highest level. Uh, but you mean, you mean like how you get paid by your clients? How you get paid by clients. That's exactly right. So, um, the short version is if we don't find anything, you don't pay us anything. Um, but from a performance standpoint, what we find, then your, our fee is a percentage of what we find. Right. And we do have some clients that they just like us doing some of that work. So we do have an hourly, um, group mm-hmm. inside our organization because we're so efficient and, and our people are so, you know, tuned into what we do. There are a lot of clients that say, you know what, it's actually cheaper to hire us to do some of the back of office type of stuff. And that's a component of our business. But um, by and large, the, the biggest part of our business is going in and finding overpaid taxes. Yeah. Yeah. So your, your 2,300 
employees you you describe as neurosurgeons of tax or yeah. like to geek out over tax. Yeah. You know, is that you? Yeah. So I'm not that person, right? <laughs> My daughter yeah. told me uh, when when I started, she said, "Dad, you're going to work with a bunch of accountants. That's just not that sexy." And I said, "Sis, <laughs> tax is sexy, man. I mean, this is yeah. really this is really cool. This is some of the smartest people in the world." Uh, but I'm the people guy in the midst of all of this um, tax, finance, accounting. Yeah. You know, out of out of my 20 to 2,300 people, almost 1,800 of them have some type of professional certification, right. either attorney, CPA, or something like that. So um, it's a when you start looking at sides of brains. We clearly yeah. lean to one side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So talk about your talk about your role. And so you've, you've told me a little bit about the about the company and the people there and, and and your role. So tell us a little bit about your role. I, you I have the privilege of being the chief people officer. So in 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 most spaces, it's the chief HR officer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, CHRO. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We refer to it as the CPO or the chief people officer. Uh, and that you think comes, there's a difference? Between I do. I really, I really, really difference? do. A lot of people ask me about that, too. When I was at Brinker uh, International, which one of your neighbors, by the way, you yeah. can actually see their building from here. <laughs> uh, when I was at Brinker International, it was referred to as the chief people officer also. also. And for years at Ryan, it had been the CHRO, right? And so credit goes to Jenny Kissling, our global president, COO. She, when she took over as the role and she was looking to fill this position, she said, you know what, at the end of the day, we're in the people business. And I really want somebody who's not just an HR tactician, mm -hmm. but I want somebody who can help with our people. Mm -hmm. And so um, to her credit, she changed the title of the role. And it is a much more deliberate focus on the people. I do think a lot of people ask about this. And look, at the end of the day, when you when you get into your peer set, yeah. a lot of them are referred to as HROs. And I don't begrudge anybody that, but when I'm asked what's the difference, I always, you know, how I see the difference. The CHRO tends to be, and I won't get in trouble. Some <laughs> some of my friends are going to call and say, right, "Well, what the heck are you doing?" It's much better, right? To, to yeah, 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 have yeah. The real it's, conversation. it's a podcast. What are they going to do? They're right. not going to come get me, right? Right. But the CHRO typically and traditionally has leaned more into the tactical side of HR. Right. And it has been more of the HR blocking and tackling component. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. The CPO tends to be a little more holistic, looking at the whole culture, looking at the whole component and being a tad bit more strategic focused on the people. Now, look, every single one of my peers and good friends that are called CHROs are going to call me and say, very well, we do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 <laughs> I know. I'm, this is a really, really big, broad brush. But ultimately, that's kind of the that's kind of the difference. You know, well, if they complain, we'll get them on the podcast. That's we'll it. They explain. can defend themselves. That's, that's, exactly, a, that's right. exactly right. They exactly can right. defend themselves. Look, we're in the people business, uh, and for some reason, saying that we're in the human business doesn't seem yeah. to have the same. It's weird, right? right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're you're a human, and you're a resource. Step right. in line, right? Although I did have somebody, um, and I don't want to date them generationally, but um, I was introduced recently, and they said. Um, this, this is Tony Brittle. He's our new CPO. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, so you head of personnel? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> yes, 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 the head of personnel. The 60s just called. Right, they would exactly. like their title yeah, back, right? Exactly. I mean, so it, you get called a little bit of everything. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's all about people, right? And so we oversee, we oversee anything that has an impact on people. And so I, we actually, uh, when I got to the, when I got to Ryan, we, restructured how that people group is actually formed. Okay. And and we look at we look at a team member life cycle. And if you look at if you look at a life cycle, if you just can if you just envision a big circle, mm -hmm. you know, from the time that you show up until the time that, you know, you leave, there is a natural life cycle. Yep. Um, in any organization. Uh, I always tell people that that's okay. Like that's a natural thing. Is. I think people get it is. worried about where they are in the life cycle, they should just be enjoying it and working. And, that, and that's the thing. And organizations that understand the life cycle and actually manage the life cycle yeah. uh, take better, you know, care. It's kind of the care and feeding of your talent, okay. <laughs> you know, yep. at the end of the day. So we, we see it in four groups that overlap just in, you know, if you think of it as a big blown out Venn diagram, you know, we attract people, 
we develop people, we retain people, and then we sustain people. And the sustain part is the part that tends to kind of freak people out. It's like, hey, what does that mean to sustain people? Mm -hmm. Sustaining people is is seeing them continue to grow. It's mapping out their their talent pathway um, so that they're moving through the organization in some shape, fashion, or form. You know, there's some pretty interesting research that just came out. I think it's Corn Ferry that just produced this. For years, we have heard the old saying, uh, people don't leave companies, they leave leaders, right? right? Or bosses right, or right. other people, right, 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 right. And so while that is still very, very true, the, the, the best research is just out right now. And we see it in our own firm. And, and when I was a consultant, I saw it all the time. There's a new twist to this. Not only are they leaving their leaders or whatever, they're leaving because they're not being developed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're not finding a, a pathway of growth. And what's fascinating about that is development doesn't always equal promotion. And, and we used to really get our heads wrapped around this and go, oh, well, I can't promote you. There's no place to promote you. Right. Just because I'm not being promoted doesn't mean I can't be developed in place. And people are leaving Top three reasons they leave because the manager is oh whatever right they leave because of money now there's no big shocker right um, it's not the number one reason uh, but they leave for money and then they leave because they're not being developed look we can fix those those yeah. those things are very workable but unless you understand how this life cycle works uh, you end up sometimes working on the wrong thing so when you got to Ryan you're talking about restructuring the the the, the the people group or the, the the team there was was development something you focused on right away? Is that something you're going to get to? How do you identify you know what needs to be restructured? There are it's, a lot of questions there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and they're all they're all the right questions too. And so the short answer because I came out of the consulting people development business, mm -hmm. um, I immediately kind of looked in there first because if you're not developing your people, there's going to be a lot of things break down mm -hmm. along, the, along the pathway, especially when you start looking at the dating, you realize, oh, people are actually leaving because they're not being developed. We should probably look in and see how we're developing people, right? And so there's a lot of different philosophies. And, and one of the things that we discovered is that while we weren't completely broken, um, there were there were tons of opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that we we've talked about quite a bit is the number of learning hours that we actually provide. Ooh, okay. and, we, and we actually we actually have a mandatory number of learning hours that every team member is required to take on. 25 hours. It used to be 50, okay. it's 25 hours. In what period of time a year? Yeah, in, yeah. in one year. Yeah. So in it, it's not a stretch because if I have a professional certification, I've got to have right. continuing education. Right. So I mean, it, it's not like we're sitting there whipping them on the back saying, "Hey, you got to go sit in the classroom." A lot of these people came to us and said, hey, I need some classroom credit in order to keep up my CPA and my attorney or whatever the case may be. And so we were sending them out to all these vast places in the country in order to get their CE credit, CPE credits, whatever the case may be. And so the group came around and said, Poor man, we could be doing some of this internally, which is the right, the right answer. And so we actually have certified ourselves. We become certified on many pieces of yeah. content internally in order so that we can teach some of this internally, which is great, yeah. which is great. And so our thought process was for a while, and again, not, you know, it was well intended, but, you know, when I show up and I say, okay, tell me what our learning group looks like. It's like, well, we trained, you know, 20, you know, 2,800 hours of training last year, whatever the case may be. And I was like, wow, that's great. And, um, you know, everybody's really excited because we had all these training hours and everything. And, and then my next question was, well, what's our sticky rate? And they're just kind of looking at me going, what's the sticky yeah, rate? Right. <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer uh, that question. Uh, what's, right? what's the sticky rate, right? <laughs> and so I said, well, let's, so let's, let's just kind of see how this works. And so let's just take any one course that we trained last year and find something that we trained kind of the first year. And let's just kind of go back and let's just do a pulse real quick and how much retention mm -hmm. did we have? And that's when everybody's eyes just started glassing over. And all of a sudden we're realizing, oh, wow, our retention rate isn't really super, super duper. Right? The number of hours are high. Yeah, but the retention rate and, maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, who is it? Evan, Evan House, forgetting, forgetting Curve. 
um, which was some pretty famous research mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, after you teach somebody something that they start to forget after 60 days and at 90 days, if you haven't incorporated it, it's gone. Right. right. And so we put in place uh, the, the 70 2010 rule, which um, I don't know where that originally began. I know that uh, Dr. Steve Kerr, um, who was the first CLO at GE, when I, when I spoke to Dr. Kerr about this, he said that they put this formula, 72010, in play in the 70s when Jack came to him and said, hey, I want to start a, an institute for learning mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Kerr was the very first one to put together, you know, really a, a CLO position in the industry, really the first time CLO ever showed up on the, on the, uh, on the scene. And he started, he prescribed to the 702010 rule, which, you know, if you, if you're not in the space and you don't get geeked out about that type of stuff, it's how we learn. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so some of the best research would say that 10% of our learning happens in the macro in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Right. So 10% of learning happens in the classroom. 20% of our learning happens one-to-one. -one. Me and you sitting across the desk yep. talking about the thing that just happened in the classroom, right? It's the right. coaching, it's the mentoring, it's ongoing. And 70% of our learning happens from the integration of what I learned in the classroom, what I talk about with you with my coach, and now I integrated it into what yep. I do, right? Yeah, and so it's 70, 20, 10. And so what was happening is, is we became masters at the 10. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the analogy I always use is, we ran them in and got them wet, but they ran out and dried off, right? And we yeah. just we didn't keep them wet. And so we have a very similar cadence. We call it LRT, right? Learn, renew, transform, right? So we put them in a learning environment, whatever that is. Often it's a macro learning environment in the classroom. However, you and I both know learning environments are changing pretty right. pretty quickly now. Yeah. But so we put them in a learning environment, and then almost immediately within the 90 day mark, we put them in a renewal environment of some kind. We call them booster shots internally. Okay. And so we're constantly giving booster shots to that thing they learned in the macro, right? So if I taught you something in classroom, and oh, by the way, side note, we're taking the classroom size down in the learning hours. Sure. Oh sure. my gosh, it used to, remember the old days, yeah, you get in the classroom the for a week, yep. right? You get everybody in the room, you have them in there for a week, you lock the doors, and it's just by the time you have your brains bleeding out your ears, right? And so we we scrunched it down, and then all of a sudden you're doing an eight-hour day, and some of the best research is saying now that in the in the macro classroom environment, if I can get you into a big environment with a big short burst, your ability to retain that is going to be a little bit higher. So you know, I put you in eight hours of classroom, and I give you 200 points to remember. Mm -hmm. Right? You got a notebook when you walk out, and you go, "Oh, where do I go?" Right? right. Put it on a shelf. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's, that's exactly what happens, right? And so, uh, you know, TED Talk was the one who kind of pioneered the short. Mm -hmm. and TED Talk. When TED Talk first came out, you know, learning through talks, uh, it was 20, 30 minutes. 20, 30 minutes. Uh, from a TED Talk standpoint, and everybody's going, oh, this is great. I can actually learn something, right? right? And they'll watch some of these, some of these videos are watched, you know, 20, 30, 40 million times. Yeah, yeah. And so everybody's going, hey, that kind of works, right? 20, 30 minutes. Maybe we should start looking at it bursts, 20, 30 minutes. Now TED Talk's coming back, now TED Talk's coming back saying, you know, maybe it's even less than that. Maybe it's 18 minutes or less. Maybe it's even eight minutes. Right. Now think about that. I mean, now you're starting to get into, you know, how we're starting to learn. And when you look at it from a learning um, scientific standpoint, we are conditioning our brains for shorter bursts, not for longer extended bursts, yeah. right? Uh, to the point that if you watch the Super Bowl, you will have seen, whether you knew it or not, a new format from a commercial standpoint that was eight second eight second commercials. That's right. That's right. And where they get that from? They got that yeah. from YouTube. So YouTube has oh, built their yeah. platform. When you watch some of the high view YouTubes mm -hmm. and they put they put commercials, they embed commercials in it. They're eight second commercials. And so we're teaching, you know, a generation for these short bursts. Yep. And so they, they tested that on NFL games leading up to the Super Bowl. Um, T-Mobile did some and everything. And they actually teased them, which is brilliant priming. I mean, it's some of the best research, right? 
brilliant priming. They would they would come out of a promo on on an NFL game. And they say now this quick message from T Mobile, and they would they would split screen it. Yep. In eight seconds, you would see this, and they primed you for what was coming in Super Bowl. It was absolutely brilliant. Yep, done very well. Market. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. And so what's happening is from a learning standpoint, our attention spans are getting shorter. And because of that, we have to be very aware of how we teach and most importantly, how we renew from a, from a booster shot standpoint and then how we integrate. And so classrooms, there's sometimes you just can't get away from a two day classroom right. environment, right? There's sometimes you can't get away from that. But if you're going to put people in a two day classroom environment, you've got to give them small chunks in order for them to make sure they understand what they're taking away. And then renewal, you know, hey, look, you've got to. Wow, I mean, how much content's on our phones? I mean, both our phones are sitting right here next to us on this podcast. What's the statistic that on any at any given waking moment of our lives, our phone is not more than three feet away from us at any right. given time? Right. Is that a scary statistic? <laughs> I, I don't mean, know. And the fact it depends that, on what you're doing. That's there. right. <laughs> and, and the fact that Siri or Alexis or Google is listening to you right. is even more scary. Uh, I mean, even my watch, I pulled out of my driveway the other day, and I was on my way to Chick-fil-A, like I am most Saturday mornings. And before I got to the stop sign at the end of my street, my watch pinged and said, 13 minutes to Chick-fil-A. Right. Traffic is light, unprecedented. And I'm like, okay, that is scary. It knows where, it knows where you're going, it knows right? Where you're going. It knows where you're going. So learning, I, for me, learning and development is kind of where it starts, right? Do you, do you think learning and development is the biggest challenge that you have at Ryan or that Ryan has in general? What's the, what's the biggest people challenge? Um, oh, yes. Uh, so the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's unique to Ryan. Mm -hmm. I think that's unique to any organization. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a, and I was a senior partner at Partners in Leadership, which was international consulting firm for a dozen years or more. And our role was to help align organizations' culture, teach accountability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We were basically in the development space. It, we were hard-pressed to ever go into an organization and find – it's the exception, not the rule. The exception is you find a learning organization who really gets it and development's not really an issue. The rule is kind of um, – People get wet, they dry off. Mm -hmm. And we run them through this car wash of training and we dip them and all of a sudden we, we tick the box and we confuse learning and development with training hours. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And not, not necessarily transformation. Yep. So you've mentioned, so the, the, the role at Ryan, you mentioned being consultant partners in leadership. Yep. You mentioned Brinker. Yeah. All three very different types of yeah, companies. Yeah, isn't so, it fun? So how, did you, how do you get from one to the other? Right? You would how think I was get... a millennial with all that, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's crazy. I studied architecture, theology, and business in school, and I do what I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. There's no, um, there's no pathway in school that says, hey, I think I want to be here. Let's go study these classes. Right. A lot of times – uh, students that are getting ready to go into college or in college and they got to figure out what they got to declare. I'll get a phone call, I'll get a text, I'll get an email and I say, hey, I'm thinking about going into HR, what should I study? Mm -hmm. And my response is, well, uh, the flippant response is it doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> anything you want. <laughs> anything you anything want, you right? Want. That's right. Um, the, the, the more deliberate response is anything involving people. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and it's, it, it's, it's crazy. I had a conversation with a former U.S. congressman last night. And so uh, uh, former Congressman Chet Edwards actually works for us now. He was 20-year congressman uh, from the state of Texas. I just just learned that he was on uh, President Obama's shortlist for vice president. Wow. I mean, here's a really, yeah. really, really cool guy. Yeah. And um, he sat through one of my sessions yesterday, came up. We had this just amazing conversation. Uh one of the most genuine individuals that you could ever possibly have a conversation with. And he shared a story with me and I told him, I said, Mr. Edwards, I'm absolutely going to share the story. And he smiled and he said, okay. <laughs> um, so he went to Harvard and when he graduated Harvard with his MBA, they gave the, they gave the whole class this assessment and they said, um, Hey, we want to learn more about what's going on. So what are the, uh, what are the least important classes that you had when you were here? What's the most important? So they listed the least important, 
the least important classes, and it was organizational behavior, <laughs> mm-hmm. it was communication, mm-hmm. and it was ethics. Mm-hmm. The three least important classes while they were there. 25th anniversary classes back in, in, in Boston, Cambridge, they're at their 25th anniversary, and Harvard got together and said, hey, we want to do a follow-up. Brilliant. Harvard's always following up, right? right, right. We're going to do a follow-up. In your careers, looking back at your MBA classes, which classes do you use the most now? The number one class was organizational oh, sure. And it was, it was, I just sit there and stared at them. I said, this is gold. Really? This is gold. Because we talk about this all the time. We talk about this all the time. You know, what's important, which is, where, where do we focus more? Strategy or culture? And clearly people always say strategy. And then when we ask the other question, well, what has the biggest impact on the results of a business? People say, well, culture. And then you ask, well, why don't we focus on culture? And, and the answer is always the same. Well, strategy is really easy. Right. And it's because that's what we teach in school. That's right. That's right. That's what we teach in school. And so I, I spoke to uh, two graduate classes at A&M a couple weeks ago. And one was an HR class, a graduate level class on HR. And the other was a graduate level class on engineering. And the the... Um, the HR class, I asked them, I said, define culture. And somebody Googled it. I swear to you. Right, somebody right. put their phone under the desk and Googled it, yeah, right? Smart. They don't want to do this. Yes, yeah, exactly right. I, I love that they're, they're like, going, well, what's Siri say about it, right? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we kind of bowled it down. I said, well, how many classes are you really taking on culture? And they're all going, ah, right? And they said, well, how many classes are you taking on strategy? And they're like, well, are there really Every classes? Single one, right? Yeah, because, because that's it. And we don't see the people aspect of it. And you know, so I'm kind of going around the block to answer this question, but ultimately, I didn't study anything about culture in school. I didn't study anything about um, HR in school or or any of this other stuff. But what I did understand in school was my strength. And my daughter and I have this conversation all the time. She's a young entrepreneur, and we we talk about this all the time. We're asking kids to declare their major before they even understand themselves Mm -hmm. clearly, right? And the greatest thing that we could do for anybody going into college or even when they're in high school is help them identify what their strength is. You know, look, here's some self-awareness. This is possibly something that you're really good at from a strength. This Mm -hmm. is a strength that you have, right? And... And what I discovered was when I was going through school, because I have a learning disability, I'm highly dyslexic. Matter of fact, I signed your book a while ago, and I had to ask, okay, say your name out loud so I can see it in my head. <laughs> you spelled it right. Because I know, that, thank you, because I know when I start to write it down, all the letters will be there, but they <laughs> might not be in the right order. It's the right? best part. It is the best part. Right. And so, you know, for me, um, early on, they didn't diagnose my dyslexia until I was entering college. So that by that time, all of my learning had been stamped on how I learned, right? So I, I leaned into one of the strengths that I had, and from a visual standpoint, I could see things in three dimension. I can, I you know, from an artistic standpoint, I can make things look really good. And I leaned into architecture like nobody's business. I loved architecture. Now, when it comes to you know putting words on plans and stringing dimensions. You know, I always had to have somebody fact check me <laughs> because <laughs> different words ended up coming out really funny on there. Sure. But what I learned is I had this really unique strength of seeing the details of something, mm-hmm. whether it's a building, whether it's uh, you know a set of plans. If you say, and we're sitting in a 19-story building right now, I can look around this building and I can see all the little intricate details on how it's put together. That's structure, right? And then... When I finished architecture, and I actually owned an architectural firm here in Dallas and had two great partners, um, but when I finished architecture, I, um, I felt this urge inside of me um, for, for ministry and for theology, and so I studied, so I studied theology. Mm-hmm. And what I realized is, wow, I really love people. Mm-hmm. It's like um, while I was studying how scripture worked, while I was studying how all these things looked, and Greek was interesting, but when you're dyslexic and you and Greek is hard anyway. Right, but when you're right. dyslexic, Greek is really weird, right? Yeah. Uh, but I learned as much as I possibly could. But what I took away from there is, wow, we're all people and we're different, and that's fascinating. 
And so now all of a sudden architecture and structure and people, and then I figured, well, if I'm going to be in the business world, I probably ought to understand about business. So I started learning about business and how business works. And what I found was, well, the, one of the best things that ever happened to me was one of the worst things that ever happened to me. I'm going through my career and one day I got fired. Fired is harsh, but I got fired. Yeah, my wife said, you got fired, right? right? I mean, it was a mutual situation where they said, I said, this isn't really working. And I'm sitting there going, I'm getting fired, right? right? It's like, right. no, it's just not working. It's like, I'm getting fired. And it was that moment to where I had to sit back and go, okay, that didn't work. Why didn't that work? And what would work? And some of our really dear friends um, uh, were having dinner with them one night. And I'm trying to soft play it. It's like, ah, oh, things didn't work out. My wife's like, you got fired. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is heartbreaking. And he said, you know, uh, there's, some, there's a company that you really need to talk to. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, fine. So he sends a letter off. And then a week later, I get this letter. And the short story is I end up making a trip to California to meet with the founder and owner of this consulting company. Mm -hmm. And he sat down and we started having this conversation and we just started talking about everything. We started talking about faith. We started talking about business. We started talking about, of all things, architecture and everything. And he looked at me and he said, man, you're like a perfect consultant. I said, why? He said, because you see all these little things. I had no idea that you were seeing them, that I was seeing these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, well, what do you think about this uh, the structure over here? And I'm like, well, you know, if you do this and you do this and you do this, I had no idea that my ability to see how structure works, how I can how I could take something and disassemble it, see all the pieces, and then put it back together, and then have a true empathy for people. He said, Tony, you're like the perfect consultant. And I'm like going, oh, I never thought about that. And he said. I want you to, I want you to, I want you to look at what we do and how we do and everything like that. So, you know, way back then when it started, the old saying, duck to water. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. And here's the thing. At that moment, I discovered my purpose. Mm -hmm. And it was a lightning bolt. Now, the downside is I was getting ready to turn 40, right? So I'm in my, I'm in my late 30s. And part of it was a little bit of remorse. My like, gosh, I spent 37 years missing this. How cool would it have been for the first 37 years? Yeah, so how would <clears> – I love that story and the, the story that of, of discovering yeah. those, those strengths. I mean, not to be perfectly honest, I don't – at my age now, too, I don't really care what age it is you discover that. When you discover that, that's a really great thing. I'm totally all in. What yeah. – Thinking about this, though, you, you talked about your daughter, you talked about people calling you and asking you for advice. Like, what is that advice you give to people who are younger around this? Identify your strengths, be self aware, discover your purpose. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can tell someone to do that, but that yeah. doesn't well, mean they're going to do it. So, yeah, what's your advice? Well, a lot, of it, a lot of it is they don't know how. Okay. Right. Um, I mean, they don't have to go out and do it. I mean, they could go and say, ah, it sounds really good. I don't know. how, But because they don't know how, they don't do it. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I wrote a whole book on it because it was that important to me. The, the, the short answer to get to what it is, is I always tell people find their strength. They say, well, how do I do that? There's a couple of great assessments that you can go out and find strengths. I mean, Gallup did the best research in the world on it. Marcus Buckingham, who was one of the original researchers, he started his own company. He does some great work on it. You can go online. You can take an assessment. And you can get really, really close to what your strength is, right? And a strength is, I look at it this way. Um, it's a gift and talent, mm -hmm. right? It's a gift and talent. And some people say, well, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. Then I'll, then I'll ask them this. Find your best friend, and I sometimes have to lean in and say, you do have a best friend, right? right. So, so yes, I have a best friend. Okay. <laughs> Find your best friend. Next time, you have, next time you're having lunch with your best friend, ask him this question. What am I doing when I'm the happiest? Mm -hmm. Great question. Because that gets you really close yep. to a starting point. When I am the happiest, what am I doing? Now, if they come back and say drinking, and then you got to go, okay, we probably ought to unpack that a little bit, <laughs> well, it's right? Than getting it's angry. socializing. It's better than getting yeah, angry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right? It's like, so maybe you have to pull that thread a little bit and unpack that. It's like, well, you know, I, I, I'm socializing or whatever the case may be. But it's the thing that I'm doing uh, when I am the most happy. Uh, and 
um, some of the some of the best new research, and I'm a big I'm a kind of a research geek, right? Um, the Heath brothers out of I think it's Stanford. Uh, they wrote uh, Sticky, and they have a new book out right now called The Power of Moments. Mm -hmm. I got to read it. It's 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 yeah, they're, if you're, they're if great you're really, authors. Yes, they're great yes, yes. They're, and, and, they're, and they're easy to read and everything. Yep. Some of their Dan and Chip Heath. Yeah, that's it. Dan and Chip. Yeah, uh, The Power of Moments. Mm -hmm. And if you if you once you get through that book, you're going to find some really really cool research. As a matter of fact, my daughter and I talked about it on our podcast just recently because it was that impactful, and it was purpose and passion. Oh my gosh! And I don't know if you've seen this or not. It is purpose and passion. And uh, what they did is they um, they got this research from a Berkeley professor, five thousand employees, and he's looking and their managers, and he's looking for the highest potential. What is the highest potential? Where do you find the highest potential? So five thousand people. He did this research, and he created this graph: high purpose, low purpose, and then on the other axis, high passion, low passion. So the two easy ones to fill in, right? Low purpose, low passion, easy, easy number to mm -hmm, fill in. Mm -hmm. 10th percentile, the lowest 10% of the organization. You're sitting there going, okay, I could have, I could have told you right. that one without doing the research. Right. Okay. Then the other one was high purpose, high passion, 80th percentile. You're sitting there going, got it. Right. Done. Done. So the, fill in the two easy ones first. Right. Here's where it got really interesting. High purpose. No, I'm sorry. Low purpose, yep. high passion. Mm -hmm. So my passion is really, really high. And so you got to define purpose and passion. Passion is my enthusiasm at work. Purpose is I have a meaning in what I do, mm -hmm. right? Low purpose, high passion. Take a wild guess. What do you think? Of, of percentage? What, 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 what percentile? Where you rank from a high performer, you know, well, highest potential. We've, we've been sitting here talking about development and culture, so I'm guessing <laughs> I'm guessing it's a lot of people in the organization are high passion, low purpose. Like yeah. they don't feel like this job is their purpose in life. Twentieth percentile. Yeah. Yeah. So from when you look at your highest performers, if you have a high passion but you have a low purpose, you're in the you're in the twentieth percentile. Mm -hmm. And so he flipped it and he said, okay. I have high purpose, but I have a low passion. 64th percentile. Whoa. Stunning. Yeah. Stunning. And so what, what I took away from that is a lot of times I can be passionate about something, but if, if I don't have a purpose, if I can't understand meaning in that, I will run out of gas. And when you start looking at turnover rates, when you start looking at your talent, when you start looking at – um, you know, the stream of people that you're, you know, being a good steward of from mm -hmm. a development standpoint. If you get people in your organization and they have a passion for something, that is awesome. But if they can't connect to that work, right. they will run out of gas. And so you get them for two to three years and then they're not being developed. They don't see meaning in what they're doing. They punch out. Yep. And then all they, of a they end the life cycle. Right. They do. They, they, they do. Choose to. They they self select out mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's no meaning here. It's a paycheck. Um, I'm not being developed. There's no meaning here. I can't connect to this, so they punch out. And the opportunity cost to replace those individuals after two, three, four years, and even five years, the opportunity cost starts to go up exponentially because look at what you've invested up to this point. Right. And that's the thing that we're missing. So when people ask me which is more important, passion or purpose. Hands down, purpose mm -hmm. all day long. And so I'll define purpose. And in my last book, I define purpose as your your gifts and your talents wrapped around what you value most. So when your gifts and your talents meet what you value most, you're going you're going to get there. And so people ask me all the time, you know, what do I need to be doing? Where do I need to be going? I'll say, well, what's your purpose? And they'll look at me like, dude. I don't have time for that soft stuff. Right. Okay. What's your strength? Uh, I don't know. And so you have to start kind of small. And quite frankly, my belief is we need to be starting this conversation in high school. Sure. And we need to be, you know, helping uh, students understand what they're good at. The thing that wears me out more than anything else in the talent space and even in the educational space is um, trying to trying to work on weaknesses. 
You know, it's like, oh, and this is an interview question that, quite frankly, you know, should be banned. You know, what's your strength? Oh, it's this or Okay, right. what's your weakness? And it's like, why are you even asking me that? Yeah, nobody right? wants to tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody wants to tell you weakness. But here's the thing. And, you know, Roy Spence told the best story ever on this. Roy Spence was um, GSDM ad agency out of Austin, yeah. Texas. He was the S. Uh, Roy Spence, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago was voted admin, advertising man of the decade, mm -hmm. right? So we knew Roy Spencer Brinker because his firm and him, he was responsible for, oh, well, baby, back, baby, back, okay. baby, back, baby, yeah. right? Yeah. He's responsible for Southwest Airlines, ding, yeah. right? Okay. So he, yeah. so it's kind of yeah. like he knows a little bit about what's going on, right? Um, and so Roy Spence is talking and he's telling his story and we had him on, we had him on stage um, at one of our general managers conferences and he's telling his story. And he said, you know, I grew up, I grew up with a mother who was an English teacher. Okay. For me, that would be a lot of pressure as a dyslexic. I did. I did as well. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, and you're a much better writer than I am. Right. So, so he grows up and so he tells a story. He's in eighth grade and he's in an English class and they have to write this paper. He writes this paper, he gets it back. And in the upper corner, it says C, big red C circle around it. And on the other side of the page, it said 12. And that was the number of misspelled words. And so he, he jokes, he said, look, in, in a house where your mom's an English teacher, you never want to take home an English paper that's, that's right. a C with 12 misspelled words. And he's like, going, oh, my gosh, that's horrible. He finally makes it through his eighth grade year. He gets to ninth grade. He's in English class. They get one of their assignments. And lo and behold, the assignment is to write a paper on a topic. And the topic that was picked was the, was the same topic from the previous year. And he's like, I got this. I know, what to do. I know this topic. I know. I know this topic. He writes the paper. He gets the paper back. And in the upper right-hand corner, an A. And on the other side of the paper, it, there was a big, gigantic 13. 13 misspelled words. And he takes it home to his mom. And he says, Mom, I don't understand. I had more misspelled words, but I got an A. And, she, and it was just so impactful. She looks at him and she says, son, it's really clear. You're a horrible speller. <laughs> and then she said this, but you're a great storyteller. Yeah. And she, he, and he said, he tells the story and he says, my mom said the one thing to me that has stuck with me my whole life. She said, son, don't spend one second of your life trying to be a better speller. Wow. Yeah. But spend every moment of your life trying to be a better storyteller. That is strengths at its finest, yeah. right? How many times how many times do we have students or, or young people coming out of school or whatever the case may be, and they're wasting so much energy trying to lean into something they don't think they're mm -hmm. good at mm -hmm. from a weakness versus saying, here's the thing I'm good at and put every bit of energy around that and all of the opportunities that come out of that is enormous. Yeah. And so when young people come in and say, what should I do? Find out what you're good at and lean into it so stinking hard yep. that you're the best in the world. Yeah, that's great advice. I want to get tactical quickly because I, I can almost guarantee, we haven't talked about this, but there is a measurement part of your job that is oh. important to measure something. Right? Yeah, you got to. So right. what, yeah. you know, what are those things? I mean, I, yeah, obviously we got... Development, you have to measure that. Yeah, yeah, Culture, yeah. we spent a little bit of time talking yeah. about. Um, how, what do you measure? What are the most important things that you measure? This is actually the right question. We probably buried the lead. We could have started with this question, <laughs> right? Because because this is the right question. At the end of the day, everything I do from a people standpoint, everything my team does, and I have an amazing team, yes, there are nits and bits and measurements for all those things, but everything comes up to one final measurement, right? So we talk about accountability. We say accountability begins with clearly defining results, right? And so we actually did this research at, at Partners on Leadership, and we asked, you know, 40,000 people over the course of two or three years, are the key results in your organization defined and understood, clearly defined and understood? And, you know, surprisingly, it was a low number that said, no, they're not defined and understood because there was two words in that. Are they defined and are they understood, right? So it's one thing to know a result, it's something completely different to understand how you connect to that result. So we say every organization needs to have a set of results. They need to be memorable, measurable, and meaningful. Right? Meaningful, most important. I got to be able to connect to them. Mm -hmm. So we have four in our firm. P 
people, clients, revenue, and EBITDA. Okay. All right. So this is not revolutionary stuff. Right. Right. It's you take care of your people. Your people take care of your clients. Your clients provide revenue. If you run the business well, then you get an EBITDA. Right. So, OK, so there's the thing. We measure ourselves up against those results because it's very easy for a department or a function to get into a bubble or a silo or a swim lane and say, OK, I'm going to measure myself with the number of training hours. Right. So we look at SHRM or we look at whatever and we say, OK, the number of training hours per person is twenty two point four. We're going to be best in class. We're going to give everybody twenty five training hours and we're going to say twenty five training hours. Quote, unquote, that's our goal. And, you know, we hit the goal when we hit twenty five training hours per team member. Mm -hmm. Right. I can absolutely tick the box and do twenty five training hours and not move the needle one lick on revenue. Right not move the needle one lick on client experience, right? Right, right? So everything we do has to move the needle on those four things. So if you ask me, how do I measure? I measure through our, our team member, our people experience, our team member experience, our yep. client experience, our revenue numbers, and our EBITDA numbers. And those are our final measures. So mm -hmm. from a people um, experience, we, uh, we were just recently, I should brag on this a little bit. I'm definitely buried the lead on this. Fortune Top 100, Best Place to Work, came out on Monday, number 71. Yeah, that's great. Number 71. Uh, we share the list with two other Dallas um, organizations. Um, both of their CHROs are good, dear friends of mine. Um, I did beat both of them, so <laughs> I, not that they didn't get a text message right off the bat. Uh, not that it's competitive. Nope, no, not that no. it's competitive. I took a screenshot of the first one because I beat her by two spots. <laughs> and, she, and Amy's texting me back going, well, congratulations. I said, oh, it's not a race, but hey, look. Right, right. But here's the thing. Millions of organizations can sign up for this, can apply yeah. to this. And they pick 100. We were number 71. The last time we got it uh, three years ago, we were number 92, which just barely made the cut. Um, so we focus a great deal on our people. Uh, that is an intense process mm -hmm. to go through that. We know what those questions are, and embedded in those questions, we feel are five really important questions that help us understand the the team member experience, and if we're creating the right team member experience, we measure those. Now, when you measure them one time, you and I both know because of the businesses we're in, when you measure them one time in the middle of the year, it's a little bit of a lagging indicator. Mm -hmm. And so uh, starting this year, we're actually pulsing those questions throughout the year. We have this mm -hmm. amazing tool internally that allows us to pulse individual questions throughout the year and just ask every team member one question. Uh, it's a little bit like a TripAdvisor type yep. thing, hit this yep. number. And we can see almost live trends now yeah. on how we're doing on any of these types. So we can check and adjust. It's about the experience, right? What's the experience we're creating for you? Client experience the same way. Every time we do an engagement with a client, we ask them a series of questions. And, you know, think of it as a net promoter score. Would you recommend us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. We ask a series of questions and, and we watch that every year, right? Revenue is pretty easy. Right. Uh, you, you set a number, you drive to that number. That one's that one's pretty easy. Um, and then even uh, my dad used to tell me growing up, so it's not how much you take in. It's how much you get to keep. Right. Or you run the business well, that, that type of stuff. Now, that works for, you know, for profit type of organizations. I sit on two nonprofit boards and we have this conversation all the time. You know, what is it that we need to be measuring? Mm -hmm. And you can you can come up with in any organization. Profit, nonprofit, whatever the case may be, you can come up with whatever the key result is. The challenge that you have to have is it has to fit those three criteria. Can you remember it? So if you give me 25 things, I'm not going to remember 25 things. Yep. Three to four. That's yep. it. Three yep. to four. That's it. Can you measure it? Move it from point eight. You can't move what you can't measure. So, you know, what's the measure? And is it meaningful? Which means if I've got 100 people in my organization or if I've got 100,000 people in my organization, Every single individual needs to be able to put a fingerprint on that result. And, and a lot of times I used to get clients come back and they say, um, well, okay, so one of our results is strategic acquisitions of, um, uh, of you know, of, of clients uh, in the marketplace to grow a vertical 
blah, 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 right? He sit there and you go, wow, that sounds really smart. Uh, how many people are really going to be involved in that and say, well, there's like four of us that do it. So, so okay, that's a great strategy or even an initiative, but it's not a key result, right? Right. And they said, no, it's important for the firm to grow. I said, oh, it's important for the firm to grow. So you're saying growth is important. Well, yeah. Well, how much growth? Well, we need, you know, 8% growth this year. Oh, how many people are, in, are in part of growth? Well, everybody, okay, that's your result, that's your, yeah, right? Yeah, and your right. part of that is those strategic acquisitions, yeah. right? And so for me, from a learning standpoint or from a talent acquisition standpoint or from a, a total reward standpoint or even from a sustainability managing a career path, um, I know our team looks at, I know cost of hire and turnover. So if I'm not hiring the right people and I lose them in six months or a year, mm -hmm. that costs the firm money. Well, that hits bottom line. Um, and from a revenue standpoint, I lose connectivity with clients mm -hmm. and productivity. So that hurts my revenue standpoint. Um, and if they're, and if my client all of a sudden has someone here today and gone tomorrow, my client score goes down because mm -hmm. there's a disconnect. Um, and the people experience is bad. It hits every single one of mine. So I know that I have to hire the best people. And so we measure that particular component from a development standpoint. Look, if I'm losing people at the back door because they're not being developed, that hits every single one of my right. key results, right? Um, from a total reward standpoint, this is a tough marketplace. Comp's got to be right. Benefits has got to be right. Every other type of a reward uh, that we talk about in a total package on how we compensate and incentivize people, that's got to be dialed in, right? Because if it's not, guess what? I'm going to bleed people out the back door, yeah. right? And then from a sustainability standpoint, am I helping the business manage the business? If I go into part of my business and I say, hey, my busy year is, pick a, pick a September, right? If my busy year is uh, September, and if I look in the talent pipeline, and, and I'm mapping my talent and I realize the busy year is September and I know what my turnover rate is and I know that I've got these key people mapped out. Uh, I can I can look at the busy year or when they're going to spike and who's in the development pipeline and how many people I got. If I'm not helping them manage that work stream, I'm done. It's going to hit every single one of my key results. And so we put together the results for us that we know that when we deliver, it's going to move the needle on all four of these things. That's the key. Every organization has to have key results. If you don't, you need to sit down and figure that out. Yeah. So I think I think the the time is hopefully getting past where the human capital area of the business is disconnected from the operational side of the business or disconnected from the C the CEO's office. You know, talk about the relationship you have with the CEO at Ryan, because if you if one of the metrics that you care about is EBITDA, for example. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the way that you run the people side of the business is critical to the to, to generating EBITDA. So what's talk about your relationship with the CEO and and what that really means and how you do the job? We have a very unique structure. Uh, privately owned. So our CEO is the chairman of the board. He only has three direct reports. Right. Um, two assistants and uh, our global president and COO, mm -hmm. Jenny Kissling. Mm -hmm. And then Jenny has everyone else, mm -hmm. right? So I report to Jenny um, and Jenny reports to Brent okay. and then Brent runs that. So our relationship, it's, it's, you know, it's Brent and Jenny is kind of a, yep. a, a one, a one relationship. So when I talk about one, I talk about, I talk about both. Sure. And the conversation very much when we sit down and, and have, conversations around talent and around the function, the people group function. It is very much a business conversation where in the past, a lot of times it has always been a, um, an HR conversation, mm -hmm. right? How many reports do we have? How many investigations do we have? You know, this and this. Now, while that is, uh, that still goes on, it's, uh, you know, it goes on probably more now than ever before because of the environment, you know, you have to make sure that all these things are in place. The conversations that we're having now are very business related. We've got to move the needle on this, right? We've got to drive more revenue in this market. What are we missing? And and so there's there's a um, a, a very common formula in the human talent space and the in the talent resource space. And the formula is this: structure follows strategy. 
right? Mm -hmm. And then we have, we have added on that culture supports all of it, right? And so what happens is an organization will sit down and they'll say, here's what we have to deliver this year, 10% growth. And everybody, everybody in the firm goes, ah, right, 10%, right, we'll never right. get to 10%. Right. And so we'll all sit down and we'll say, okay, let's talk about a strategy to get there. And we'll come up with, you know, you know, two or three strategies and then we'll line up all the tactics underneath of it. And we'll say, okay, now go. Well, what happens is when you don't realign the structure of the organization to deliver that strategy, mm -hmm. you find yourself in, in the industry, we refer to it as muscling a result. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And sense. so this happens so frequently in organizations that we create strategies, but we never check and adjust the structure. So if you walk in, if you walk in today and the structure of the organization is you got this person here, you got this person here, you got these teams here, these teams look the same here. And tomorrow you come up with a new strategy. And then the very next day you deliver that with the structure you have in place. You might find yourself muscling it because frequently structures need to change in order to correctly deliver new strategies that's put in front of us. And sometimes we go backwards, right? We look at our structure and go, okay, what strategy can we use based on the structure? It's crazy. And we have structures, organizational structures that haven't changed in years, but yet we get a new strategy every year, right? And so you have to, you have to define the result. What it is you want to do? What's the strategy to get there? You change the structure to drive the strategy, and then you align the culture to drive the structure to deliver the strategy to get the result. And often people, you know, they'll get to the strategy part because that's what we teach in school. Rarely will they modify a structure to deliver that, but almost never will they check and adjust the culture. And that's the thing that if you really want to create a competitive advantage, You've got to be checking and adjusting the culture to deliver. So when I sit down and have conversations with our COO and our CEO, we are constantly talking about the cultural barriers that are in front of us that will prevent us from delivering our strategy and getting our results. Those are big time strategic conversations. The single largest um, strategic initiative in our firm this year is our cultural reset. The single biggest thing, we're completely resetting our culture this year to deliver some of the biggest growth that we've ever seen in our firm's history. And that's just, and that's just visionary uh, on Brent and Jenny's part saying, look, we've been around 27 years. What got us here won't get us there. And oh, by the way, what the, the, the amount that we've done in the first 27 years, we will do that exact same amount and double. So we will... We will double ourselves in the next four years. So you, you tell me, does the structure need to look different? Right. And the, and, and the answer is absolutely yes. So my conversations, yeah, we, we talk tactical things about, you know, all the little bits and bits, but our conversations are what has to happen in the structure, what in the culture needs to be moved, shifted, tweaked, transformed, whatever the case may be, in order to continually deliver that. Organizations do it all the time, though. You can actually deliver on a desired result by muscling it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And you can get a pretty good well, result you, by muscling you, it. You, you know, risk getting fatigued. Right? That's the thing. That you, you hit it right on the head because the sustainability is the issue. You will burn people out quick. Now, depending on you know how passionate they are and how much you know right. passion and enthusiasm, you might get them for a year or two. But I mean, the thing is, is that if you're having to push a culture in the in the business, it's referred to as command and control culture. Yep, that's yep. what it's referred to, right? Mm -hmm. And if you have to lean into a command and control, it's exhausting because yep. you constantly have to do it. You're constantly having to push your people. Right. You know what's scary is some leaders are wired that way. That's where they draw their energy. Right. Right. They kind of they they get jazzed from the adrenaline rush of the emergency of the crisis or whatever the case may be and the constant push and the constant push. And while that works for some people, it doesn't work for like 95% of everybody else. <laughs> right. 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 And so that's, that's why you get turnover. 
can't afford that in a marketplace that unemployment's running 4.1 right, nationally. Right. Statistically, what is it, zero or something like that? It's it. You can't. You just you just can't operate like that for long. So we have some we have some really cool conversations um, when we when we get together and we talk. You know, what are the things? These are the conversations, by the way, leaders need to be having. Yeah. Too often we get in, we talk about the tactical, and we forget the fact that our organization is made up of people, and people collectively is culture. And if you're not managing the culture, culture will manage you. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you where I get energy from is having conversations like this. So well, this thank you. Thank you for the yeah. time. Thank I, you. I really appreciate this is a blast. In Hopefully some... it's working. Hopefully it's recording, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we hope it is. <laughs> we hope it is. Well, regardless, we've had fun anyway. Exactly. Yeah, we've had fun anyway. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. This All has right. been this has been a blast. Great. All right. Until next time. That's right. All right. Thanks. See you. Thank you for listening to the Talent Playbook podcast with our guest Tony Bridwell. To learn more about Tony, you can visit his website at TonyBridwell.com. To learn more about Ryan LLC, you can visit their site at Ryan.com. You can listen to other episodes of the Talent Playbook podcast on iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Spreaker, YouTube, Libsyn, or you come to the Outmatch website at Outmatch.com, go to the About menu, and find the podcast that way. If you've got an interest in digging into culture and engagement a little bit more, we also offer a white paper on Outmatch.com that you can download to read about culture and engagement. Thanks to our producer and engineer, Charles Summers. Great job, always, at getting the podcast ready to go and distributed. And until next time, this is Jason Ferrara saying thanks for listening.